This is Star Talk. Neil deGrasse Tyson here, your personal astrophysicist. And today we're going to be talking about the science of meditation. Let me first introduce my co host, Marsha Belsky. Not your first time with us. Welcome back, Marsha. Thank you so much. So excited to be back. And I feel like our topic will be a little easier for me to understand than cryptocurrency. Oh, that's hopefully. true. <laughs> that was that last <laughs> topic. <laughs> we, we wanted you to stay with every every bit of the, the quantum co computations. Yes. Yeah, Start but... with PhD. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so you're a comedian and a musician. That's a potent combo. So uh, I, I love your work. And uh you know, I presume this is not the last time you'll be on Star Talk. So let's, in ah, let's introduce our, our guest for the day, and that's going to be Dan Harris. Uh, many of you might recognize that name and his face. Uh, he was, he's been a correspondent for ABC News like forever, and then he retired, retired, and then took up meditation. I think he'd been doing it for a while, but then made it full time. Dan, welcome to Star Talk. Thank you. You're making me feel old. I was a correspondent forever. <laughs> it reminds me, I, okay. gave a I gave a speech once at Syracuse University, and a lot of the kids were coming up to me and saying, I've been watching you my whole life. <laughs> exactly. And I was like, next, <laughs> next. Since I was a child. Since the little... Second World War. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. So, Dan, just, just uh, a little bit about your career. Um, you weren't just sitting at the desk. I mean, you, you know, you have... Emmy Awards for your reporting. You've um, uh, so. What do you think of the the Netflix documentary? Don't look up. What, what do you think of that? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> for a minute, for a minute, I didn't hear documentary. Oh, because <laughs> <laughs> the media is is deeply implicated in that. In yes, that movie. Uh, yes, I have no. Especially now that I'm not uh, part of the media, I'll yeah, I'll start bashing, and I won't get sensitive. Yeah, because you were at the Good Morning America desk for a while, and that's just I the was. kind of programming they were sort of parodying there. So yes, yes, yeah, they okay. were. Yeah, All right. I, I'm going to bring that here. Whatever you ask me, I'm just going to deny and make a, a joke <laughs> that gets me out of it. <laughs> so, so tell me, you've got this app, uh, and even before the app, or, or tell me about this 10% happier concept that you've been engaged in, not only while you were a correspondent, but even in retirement. Yes, I'll, I'll try to give you the super quick version. It all started because I had a panic attack on national television back in 2004. You can Google that if you want to see it. Um, well, so it was live. Wow. A, a yeah, was live scary. panic attack. Yes. Yeah. Um, it was like um, a better version of Al Capone's vault, you know, when you uh, when Geraldo <laughs> Rivera did that live show on primetime television and didn't find anything in Al Capone's vault. This was live, and actually something happened. I lost my mind. And um, there was an audience of 5.019 million people on, on, on a wow. warm June morning in 2004. And the reason I had a panic attack, I found out later, is um, because I was doing some very dumb stuff in my personal life. I had spent a, a lot of time in war zones. That's not the dumb stuff. The, the war zones was part of my, that was part of my reporting job. But I came home from, that, from those experiences in Iraq and Afghanistan and other places, and I got depressed. And I very unwisely self-medicated with recreational drugs. Even though I wasn't high on, on Good Morning America, I, my doctor later explained that it was a, my drug use w was enough to change my brain chemistry and make it more likely for me to freak out. And so that experience kind of put me on this journey that ultimately landed me on meditation. So, well, so I'll Mar stop there. So, Marsha, as a comedian, you, you experience exactly that same war zone thing, don't you? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <And it's> like, <laughs> I definitely am relating to it, though, because I think also, yeah, I started having really bad panic attacks and. I don't like, you know, Xanax and things like that. I'll only take it when I really have to. So I have tried meditation. So I'm super interested to like hear your journey for sure. Right. And, and if a comedian has a panic that. attack, that's the that's 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 the end of the that's the end, right? It is. It's hard too, because yeah, like I've only ever panicked on stage one time, and it was kind of weird where I was just like silent for 20 seconds, and then managed to kind of get them back but it's mm -hmm. it's a freaky ex i can't imagine doing it on live tv it's such a freaky experience right. if any if you haven't had a panic attack i mean it literally feels like you can't breathe it feels yeah. like you're having a heart attack and you can't tell anything to your brain that's like 
I'm not dying. Your brain is just like, this is it. This is it. <laughs> Wait, so Dan, good. you're you're implying that had you not had these uh, uh, coexisting factors, you might not have gone through that episode. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. I mean, I did have stage fright, you know, which I, I made a joke in one of my books that my career up until that date represented a triumph of narcissism over fear um, because I would like to be on television, but I had stage fright. And uh, so I was always kind of walking the line, but then you add in significant amounts of cocaine and uh, I crossed the line to freak out zone. Yeah, so this is doesn't th help with anxiety. I've heard <laughs> no. that. I've no. heard that. Oh. Yeah. So you both have yeah. data on this, yes. <laughs> so this is all very important theater information because when we go to our second and third segment, we'll be bringing on friend of Star Talk Heather Berlin, who's our sort of resident uh, neuroscientist, and so all these factors will matter when we share uh, what you're telling us with her. So, so tell us now, um, who, who got you started on meditation? Who, who thought? Who figured that would work for you? Well, it was multifactorial, but I think the, the most important variable was my wife. Um, uh, she gave me a gift of a book by a guy, a guy named Dr. Mark Epstein, who is a psychiatrist based in New York City, where uh, we lived until recently. And um, he uh, has written a beautiful series of books about the overlap between psychology and Buddhism. And I didn't actually know much about Buddhism other than the fact that I had stolen a um, – Buddha statue from a local gardening store when I was in high school because I thought it would help me with the ladies oh, high school. and okay. put it in my bedroom. Uh, yeah, high school. So, no, oh, because if you have if, if you have a, a Buddha on your on your windowsill, you're you're, you're hip, you're cool. Yeah, yeah. like we got the well, freaking British Museum over here it's in the eighties. In the eighties. Um, anyway, the statute of limitation on that has passed, so I think I can talk about it. Anyway, I didn't know anything about <laughs> Buddhism, but I read this book and and I realized that that um, there was so much in here that spoke to way the the way my mind works, the Buddha called it the monkey mind, this this constantly active uh, leaping from one hit of pleasant experience, one promotion, one slice of cake, one latte to the next, and yet never fully satisfied. Wait, and... It's the monkey mind minus throwing the poop. I'm, I'm guessing. <laughs> well, I mean, also, I don't know about your mind. Also, for anxiety as well. Cocaine and coffee? Correct. No wonder. Correct. I, you're, I agree with you, Marsha. I disagree with you, Neil, because I, I don't know about your mind, but my mind's throwing a lot of poop uh, <laughs> okay. at other people oh, yeah. and at myself. It's an omnidirectional poop dispenser. Oh, um, man. Okay, so it's, it's, a, it's a figurative poop dispenser. There yes. you go. All right. Uh, so, all right, so, and that sets you on your course. So I'm, I'm guessing here that, this is a very educated guess, that the uh, the meditation has, uh, is all about sort of introspection, as is so much of Eastern philosophy. So the resonance there is is kind of pre uh, preordained, right? I mean, it's it's not, the, inter the word introspection is interesting because it's not introspection in the way I think we in the West might think of it, because you're not sitting there analyzing your thoughts the way you would in therapy. By the way, I'm pro-therapy. I go to therapists and et cetera, et cetera. So that's not a degradation of therapy. But this is more of a mental exercise, which I know you'll get at in your second and third segments with um, your neuroscientist yeah, Heather friend. Berlin, uh-huh. Yeah, I mean, Heather can talk about this, but I'll just preview it by saying that and I can describe what meditation is if you want, but it, it is essentially like a series of exercises for your brain and by extension your mind, and you can see the changes on the brain scans, and that's really compelling. So it's not navel-gazing in, in the way in which we in the West might consider it. Got it. So it it's, goes beyond woo-woo, right, as they say, where if you, if you have measurable data on changes in your brain scans, uh, it means you're actually doing something. And and it's not just talk at that point. Is that fair? Yeah, I think it is fair. I mean, it's interesting. The more I've gotten into it, the the more open I am to. I, I at first I was you know I was raised by by academic physicians. I'm married to an academic physician. I I, I was not smart enough to to be a doctor, so I wear makeup and talk to television cameras for a living. But I, I, the science is really what got me over the hump and allowed to uh, it allowed me to do this thing. But the more I get into it, the the more and this is probably an inhospitable place to say this, but the more open I am to things that might ha I might have dismissed as 
woo woo, which now I would just consider sort of other ways of knowing things and that we just and that we're always looking for scientific validation. But maybe, you know, I don't meditate now because I think it's going to change my brain. I meditate because I know it makes me less of an asshole to myself and others. And that's really helpful. Okay, that anything that reduces the assaholicness in the world is a good thing, no yeah. matter what the foundations are. So yeah. what, let's, let's go back to, to square one. What is meditation? Just give me your best sort of definition for it so that we can start there. M Marsha, I know you've done it. What, uh, what flavor of meditation did you do? Do you remember? For me, it's, it's really hard for me to meditate. And what I noticed is... Um, the more I would try and structure it, the less likely I was to actually just sit there and be present. Like I would try and get um, tapes and things like that. So the times I've found I best meditate are after I do yoga, mm. whenever they have the like 10 down lay down period. Those have been my most successful times, I think, because my body has exercised and I can sort of meditate at that moment. And then just truly laying in bed in the mornings. And for me, it's putting my phone in a different room and forcing myself not to like go check it for an hour. And then I can actually just sit there and think and not watch TV. And that's what I call meditating. I don't know if it actually is, but that's sort of what's helped me with my anxiety, especially over this last year to try and stay present. And I do little things like I'll tap tap my heart, tap my head and physical things like that and point to the, like, I don't know if you've done this when you have panic attacks, but you point up and you say, I see the ceiling, I see the door. You just start naming things around you to keep yourself present. So that's so he, the kind he, of meditation. He I asked guess. you what flavor, so that sounds like vanilla. Yeah. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> that's the best vanilla. Okay. Yeah, I'm entry level meditation. Okay, so I'd be I, Rocky I Road yeah. maybe yeah. if I... <laughs> Yeah, I want to get to mint chocolate chip level. Yeah, there good. you go. There you go. Okay, so so what so what flavor, uh, Dan, are you? Well, yeah, maybe I can help disambiguate the the flavors here. So there, the word meditation is a little bit like the word sports. I mean, it describes a whole range of activities. Marsha hit on about seventy five of them in her <laughs> paragraph that she just uttered there, and yeah, and and that's all good. For me, I think that I usually start with a very basic form of meditation called mindfulness which is derived from Buddhism, but has been thoroughly secularized and has now been studied in the labs extensively. And the real, there are really three beginning steps for this. One is sit comfortably. You can lie down if you want, I don't, or you can put yourself in the lotus position. I don't like to do that because I'm 50 years old and not very limber. But you just kind of sit comfortably, close your eyes. That's the first step. The second step is to bring your full attention to the feeling of one thing, usually your breath coming in and going out. If you don't like focusing on your breath, some people find that sort of an anxiogenic and anxiety producing thing. So you can just feel the your full body sitting or lying down, just picking one thing to focus on. And then the third step is, as soon as you try to do this, you just try to feel your breath or feel your body sitting in a chair, your mind's going to go bonkers. This is the monkey mind. And you'll see that you are start, you know, start planning a homicide or you're wondering, you know, when's lunch or whatever. And the whole game is just to notice when you've become distracted and to start again and again and again. You're not trying to clear your mind. That's impossible unless you're enlightened or you've died. The whole game is just to notice when you've become distracted and start again and again and again. And the benefit is mindfulness, this kind of self-awareness that allows you to see the chaos and cacophony of your own mind without being owned by it. Wow. So that's why the silence matters, because that could create an artificial distraction that is needless in your efforts to achieve your goals. You know, for some people meditate with um, music. I've never understood exactly how that works. How about those tones, you know, those bells that you hear sometimes uh, that might resonate with some frequency within yourself? So there's sound baths, which, again, that's not something I really understand or have done mm -hmm. much of. You, the bells often in, in, the, in the flavor of meditation I come from are used to start or end a session of meditation. Oh, gotcha. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So, like I said, it's very are all Pavlovian. Kinds of very, very Pavlovian, by the way. <laughs> yes. Yes. I In like fact, some of those sounds. I like some of the ohms and the like. The bells kind of clear out your head. It feels like mouthwash in your brain, some of the frequencies. <laughs> well, I like that analogy. But just yeah. to be clear, for those who don't otherwise know, these aren't like dinner bells or sleigh bells. They're, they're tonal <laughs> bells, right? Yes. They're like. Yes. They're, I can they're... only meditate to sleigh bells. Actually, <laughs> that's, my, that's 
no, no whale noises. No, no, that, uh, no. I need more cowbell. That's what I need. That's more what cowbell I need. and Santa <laughs> screaming. Yeah. So you have, so you have an app called the Ten Percent Happier app. Well, I mean, the app is named for the the what you do, and you know, I'm, I. I want to be 20% happier. <laughs> why, why are you holding me back to, to 10%? You know, what, what's, what's the f- thinking behind that? Or did you borrow that from the business world where they say, I want you to give 110% today. And that's, of course, mathematically not real, but spiritually, emotionally, it might mean something. So where are you coming from when you get this 10% thing going? I got interested in meditation in 2008 or nine before it was cool. It was like the first time in my life I've ever been ahead of a trend. And um, I, I, some of my friends- Well, there friends... was the entire 1960s and 70s with, you know, the Maharaji, you yes. know, I mean, so yeah. th- there was some meditation going on back then, just, but you you were only just born, see? So <laughs> for, you to, <laughs> for you to say, you're a 50 year old American say, I was ahead of the <laughs> I started meditation. <laughs> no, what you might maybe uh, okay, I'll, I'll let me let me offer you a way out of what you just said. Um, could it be that you started meditating early in the social media universe? How about that? I appreciate Bef- you offering me the way out. I would say maybe I got interested in meditation before the second wave of cool happened. <laughs> okay. Because you're absolutely right. It was cool in the 60s and 70s. George and Harrison. Then it- exactly. Yes, exactly. 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 Mm-hmm. Uh, the Mahara- Ma- Paul McCartney, John Lennon, they were all doing it. So you're absolutely right. It was cool in the 60s and 70s. Then it went away and it got kind of mocked as part of the um, uh, 60s becoming a bit of a cultural caricature. And then so I, I got interested in 2008, 2009, uh, and um, a lot of my friends thought it was weird, and they were making fun of me. And one day, a friend of mine at work was saying, well, what's the matter with you? Like, why are you doing this thing? And I kind of, out of nowhere, said, yeah, because it makes me like 10% happier. And I could see the look on her face change from scorn to mild interest. Oh, that's clever. Okay. All right. You got me there. All right, ten percent. Yeah, I can. Let me go with the ten percent, and that's a starter package, right? <laughs> exactly. And since since now I'm stuck with math questions and jokes for my whole life, I'll just double down on that to say that it's like any good investment. The ten percent compounds annually. The radical good news of meditation is that, and this is what the science is showing us, is that happiness is not a factory setting that is unalterable. It's a skill you can practice. And this practice, the benefits compound over time. And that is incredibly compelling, mm-hmm. hence 10%. And I wrote a book called 10% Happier, at which I thought was going to be mildly embarrassing and go away. And then it kind of led to a podcast where I interview meditation experts and then this meditation app. which Well, that's, that's a very natural meditation. arc of an active person who's trying to get the job done. So congratulations on that. When did the book come out? Almost eight years ago, uh, okay. 2014. The 10% Happier book. And okay, we can look for that and maybe link to it. So so you have, I noticed, um, I picked up a couple of your, um, the episodes, if I call them that. Uh, you, have, you have a cadre of meditation experts that help the listener to the podcast get into different meditative states, right? And if, as I understand correctly, these different meditation experts are, are, are slightly differently tuned, relative to what your needs might be if you then tune in is that uh, if you listen is that correct yeah i mean i think there are there are different use cases for meditation we have a a lot of meditations that help you fall asleep uh some for first thing in the morning uh there are meditations that help you boost your self-awareness this word mindfulness that gets tossed around a lot another skill that meditation has been shown through a lot of research to help you with is compassion or you might just say friendliness, warmth, if you want to get grandiose about it, love even. And so that's a really compelling thing to think about as a skill. And as we look out at the, for me personally, as I look out at the world and how screwed up it is, the notion that we can boost our capacity and the capacity of other human beings to get out of their own heads and view the world empathetically through the eyes of others, that that is a skill, that's a very hopeful thing. So what's the difference between knowing your own mind better and then being able to interact with other people better? So, for example, is there a meditation 
course, let's call it that, for comedians where they can better get in the head of their audience (laughs) because they want the audience to laugh. Right. And if they don't laugh, they're not connecting in the way they need. So could you, in the limit of this, from what you're describing, have a meditation app for a meditation course flavor for every need somebody has in society. So then you lift all boats. Yes. Yes, Rather than just the boats of the people who have emotional inner needs to, um, you know, to soften. I mean, if we do courses on stress, anxiety, also relationships, productivity, having more self-awareness in in your daily life. We we there there is there is no aspect of your life that you can't make more awesome through intentionally turning it into a practice, and that's what that's the what the hardest the part is, though. You start to realize, like, oh, I could fix all my own life; it is all me, and then it's like, ugh. No, <laughs> so much work. <laughs> so, you know so Dan, I, 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 I don't think you should try, just to respond to you, Marsha. I don't think the goal is to try to fix, quote unquote, everything all at once. I think the goal is marginal improvement over time. And that Marsha, he said doable. he's a 10 percent guy. So don't yes. try to ask Listen, him for the 100 percent solution. <laughs> I like instant gratification. I don't have time for this marginal improvement over time. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> Give me a quick fix. Give me the cocaine. You know, what? Okay. It. fix it now. <laughs> fix it. I mean, yesterday. you already said you didn't like Xanax. So, I mean, that, you've I know, taken a big tool like... off the table. Like, wait, exactly. So, Dan, let me let me give a personal story here. It's not, not a story, but just I, I'm like the opposite of anxious. OK, if, if I speak in, in a public setting, it is I'm as calm as like I'm sitting in my living room and 3000 people are just there and we're chilling in the living room. That's what it feels like to me. So I have no anxiety at all i'm very comfortable in those settings and i I, there are other things that i know people reach for to compensate for what they might need i don't i I have no relationship with caffeine at all okay i'll have a hot chocolate once a week just because i like chocolate not because i'm after the caffeine that's in it so and i can sleep like that i i can walk away from this camera lay down on the on the carpet here and be asleep 10 minutes later so that's I've my never problem. been angrier at a person in my life. That's crazy. <laughs> All of like you're just basically saying everything that's haunted you your whole life doesn't really affect me, but must well, be hard. So, so what I'm saying is, I tried a, a meditation app, you know, where it said sit down, focus on your breath. I just did a lot of the stuff you were describing, and I just went to sleep. I because you know. A, a soft voice talks begins to talk to you, and <laughs> uh, and I'm sorry, I, I just go to sleep, and so maybe I'm 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 meditation proof, okay? <laughs> because I can't. <laughs> Am I unreachable by meditation? Because I don't. I, I, don't, I don't believe know. anybody is. Let me ask you this. Let me reframe it because I love everything you just said, and I I want your mind um, on many levels. Where in your life do you struggle? So I don't think about it that way. I think about it like, okay, I'm struggling because I'm an academic, right? And so I spent my whole life, there's a book in front of me and I don't know what's in it. I got to study it. And so then I work through it. You slog through it. You, the brush and bramble, you get a little bloody, maybe, you know, if it's a particularly difficult physics problem or something. And then you get through it on the other side. And the, 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 the reward is that much sweeter for having struggled to get there. So for me, a struggle is not something to bring, to bring angst within me. It, I'm attracted to it. I say, wow, I don't understand that. Let me keep at it. And that, that excites me. And I, so, I don't, I, so I, don't, I can't think about it the way you asked me the question about it. Well, I, if we talk to everybody in your life off the record, uh, would they say there are at days where you have a bad day or relationships that are fraught um, or is there say, no I, struggle in your life? I can never be woke enough for my daughter. <laughs> my 25 <laughs> year old daughter. Oh, I'm me just, and my dad fight constantly. That's what I'm saying. I, I, as woke as I think I am, I, that I will never be woke enough. That's so what she's I, there I learn, she I, you, I, yeah. I learn a lot from her. So I, you know, we talk and um, there's tension if I'm if I dig my heels in based on my own life experience. But she's a life experience that's that's that has vectors going forward, not looking backwards. And so 
I'm intrigued by that, challenged by it, and intrigued by it. But for me, every challenge is an academic challenge. Now, with regard to relationships, there's other complexities there, right? I'm married 33 years, and the, you know the big secret of marriage is that marriage is work, all right? Because it, in fairy tales, you know, where do, where do all the fairy tales end? They end at the marriage, mm -hmm. right? So the, yes. it's advice for the yes. courtship. Yes. But they don't tell you what to do after you get married. They just yes. they lived happily ever ever. Really, really, you know, give me give me some stories on the other side of that of that trench. All right. So so um, so I don't know. I think uh, sure you know talk, you can talk to my relatives and they'll say well he does this and he does that and he does that. But you're telling me that meditation is much more for yourself and what you need and what you want and so so that's an interesting uh wait can uh, i have a pitch can i say a pitch go for it to me it sounds like you said you tackle everything like an academic challenge but what the challenge of meditation is correct me if i'm wrong is like you have to see your own brain as something that's worthy of study and something that's worthy of growth and understanding and so you're like i don't have the typical struggles with somebody else but meditation might be helpful for you to understand how your own mind works yes. even more all right dan if that if if marcia's correct she is so okay <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> okay so but what she is for you i mean everybody's got to have their way in i think she astutely observed uh, identified one way in for a for a mind like yours that is really interested in science really interested in the details figuring things out buddhism and meditation i think would have an enormous amount to offer you because the mind is massively complex and fascinating and in many ways lawful and you can get interested in what makes it work so you're, you're suggesting, because that's not how you began, you began by saying, I had this problem, that, that problem, that problem, yes. and meditation solved yes. it. And yes. if you have problems in your life, medication, yes. uh, medication, <laughs> meditation, <laughs> medication works too. Uh, meditation can help you overcome them, yes. Um, yes. master them, and the like. If you have no such litany of problems, and you're not on any kind of prescription drugs, you're now saying that I'm not challenging you, I'm just asking you. You're now saying that the meditation can enhance whatever it is you're doing well and maybe even do it better. Is that- They've shown that, yeah. I think many things are true simultaneously, just as when we talk about astrophysics where I know nothing, but you can talk about one way in with meditation, which is I think the most common way in, which is suffering. People dealing yeah, most with stress, of us anxiety, suffer, Neil, depression. from anxiety. Yes, okay. but for, for you, Neil, <laughs> Sorry, <Dr. Tyson. laughs> for you, I think that there's a there's a. I I think it's phenomenal. The 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 there's an enormous amount of wisdom I hear coming through in your description of your own mind state, and that's amazing. I don't think you have to meditate. I'm not a meditation fundamentalist. I think for you, the, the, <laughs> the meditation the evangelical, yeah. evangelical <laughs> fundamentalist meditator. <laughs> the, the trick, the interesting door for you might be just intellectual interest because there's so the mind is so vast and is so interesting, and I think there would be a lot there for you to play with. And I just want to respond to one last thing, which is you said meditation is all about your own mind, but what we know f what we know about the universe is that the line between self and other is porous and blurry. And you can't, if you look, close your eyes and look for the self, for some little homunculus of Marsha or Neil or Dan in the mind, you cannot find it. We can't find the seat of consciousness in the brain. And so th we are interdependent with other people and with the universe writ large and so meditation so the modern word for that mind. in physics would be we are entangled yes 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 we yeah. are See, it's not so woo woo <laughs> because of entanglement <laughs> yeah. working on your own mind is working for the greater good the same you you, you can do okay. both at the same time that's, Can't connect I, that's, with others so you connect with yourself i eh? have no rebuttal to that perspective uh, very good uh so dan i think we have to land this plane um where can we find your your app and and uh, what do you uh, what is your greatest presence on social media i i have i'm on twitter i'm not super active um i post mostly pictures of my child or our cats um uh, <laughs> uh, my podcast is the place where i'm most active which you can find wherever you get your podcasts it's called 10 percent happier 
I also have a meditation app. My team and I, we've, we've, we've got a large team of people. We're building this meditation app, which you can get wherever you get your apps. Excellent. So it's easy to find because it's all named the same thing. And I assume you're, are you Dan Harris on Twitter? I think it's Dan B. Harris. Dan B. Harris. Okay. Yes. B think. is for, for beefcake since I'm okay. very <laughs> Did meditation get you to think that way too? <laughs> I'm still working on it. One of my many challenges is, is uh, self-centeredness, so I'm still trying to shave that down. All right. Well, Dan's been a delight to have you, and just congratulations on trying to – having improved yourself and now attempting to improve others because at the end of the day, the world is better off for people like you having lived in it. So, Thank you. Thank Imagine you. New York if we weren't all just walking around having panic attacks all the time. It'd be a different world. <laughs> It'd be a different world. <laughs> Excellent. It's okay. Great. It's great to meet you, and thank. I'm, I'm a longtime fan, so great to meet you, Neil and Marsha. I'm a new fan, and great to meet you as well. Thank you. You too. So nice to meet you. So we, when we come back, we're gonna bring on Star Talk. A correspondent? Can I call it? Can I use that word? Star, Star Talk brain correspondent, Heather Berlin, when Star Talk returns. We're back, Star Talk. We're talking about meditation, coming off our first segment uh, in a conversation with Dan Harris, ABC correspondent turned meditation guru. Ooh, do I get to use that word, Marsha? I think so. <laughs> yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah. We can totally do that. And as is the DNA of Star Talk, we bring in. Um, an academic expert on a subject matter that any of our um, pop culture representatives bring to the table. And of course, we have our neuroscientist at large, Heather Berlin. Welcome back, Heather. Always a pleasure. Always yeah, a pleasure. Yeah. And you're you're at the Icon School of Medicine. Did I say that right? Yes. The Icon School Icon of Medicine at Mount Sinai. A mm -hmm. H N at Mount Sinai. And uh, you specialize in figuring out what the brain is doing, whether or not people know it. <laughs> I think <laughs> is it, that's on your business card, isn't it? <laughs> yes, yes, exactly. <laughs> so that's let my me slogan. Just bring yeah. up some broad uh, questions here that uh, arose from that first segment. So mm -hmm. many people who have mental challenges. Right. One of them, a big one, I, I, I'm told, is is anxiety. But <laughs> <laughs> Marsha leaves the pack. Brag, on brag, brag. No, no, I'm just saying. <laughs> no, no. But there are others. There's trauma in life, for example, possibly mm -hmm. even PTSD. Uh, you can think of things that a problem that a person can't shake, shake away from themselves. And, um, you know, as as a, a, a clinical person is your first thought, yeah, there's a drug for that. Or at what point does someone say, there's a drug for that? And at what point does someone say, get to know your mind better? Maybe you can have mind over matter, mind over uh, a, a properly behaving mind over the mind that's misfiring. So how, does, how do you strike a balance between those two? Yeah, I mean, often, you know, we start with the kinds of treatments that are non medication based treatments. Um, you do. And then, yeah, yeah, for sure. And that would be, I mean, you know, forms, various forms of talk therapy, oh, using therapy, techniques, yes, of yeah, mm -hmm. of, you know, mindfulness based stress reduction or, or meditation as part, it's integrated as part of therapy, um, you know, because your thoughts, you know, can change your brain. And that is a way to change your neurochemistry just via controlling your thoughts and, and your emotions and how you respond to them. So um, we, always, we always do that first. Now, if people's neurochemical imbalance or neurocircuitry is in such a way that that is not enough, then we can supplement or augment that with medication. And then we find that there's a synergistic effect so that the medication plus the mindfulness base or the talk therapies um, work together better than either one of them alone. So it's never just like, here's a pill now go off and, 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 you know, you'll be better. It's, it's always going to be a bit of both, but, but we start always with non-medical treatments and then sort of move up the ladder. But wait, isn't a pill cheaper than therapy? <laughs> <laughs> so much. <laughs> Although I'm just it thinking. Depends. I'm just thinking. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's cheaper and faster than therapy. Yeah. I'm thinking. Yeah. Well, yeah. Well, I, 
No, but more seriously, the therapist. Yeah. If, if you know the neurochemistry, the electrochemistry mm -hmm. of let's just whoever defines it, I don't care. It doesn't matter of a normal brain. Okay. This is a brain that doesn't have uh, neurological issues that we have identified in textbooks. Mm -hmm. Is that the chemistry you're going to try to recreate in the mind of someone who has mental challenges? So first of all, there's no such thing really as a normal brain. Okay. Every brain is different. And now when we're talking about people at the extremes, Yes, you know, people with extreme um, neurochemical imbalances or um, problems in their neuroanatomy. But outside of those extremes, everybody is has something, basically. Everybody, we're all wired differently. And so there's no one ideal place that we're trying to get a person to be at. So that's why psychiatry is, is an art more so even than a science. Interesting. You know, it's not like we know, okay, it's not like you have this bacteria, take this antibiotic, you know, it is try this SSRI or a selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor and see if that has an effect. And then we sort of measure how is it affecting that person? And if it works, great. If not, okay, we'll try this drug or we'll try that. So there's no perfect- And there's also um, dosing too, right? The, the dose dosage. Yes, yes. Uh -huh. there, yeah, there's no, there's no ideal state we're trying to get. It's just, it's really individualized medicine. What works for you based on your symptomology? You know, what kind of treatment do we think is going to be best for you? And so there's no ideal state. It's just it's just what's good for you. So if you're a person who's an overthinker, you have a highly active prefrontal cortex and you're ruminating and you can't stop that inner voice, you know, giving you techniques to how to quiet it down, how to focus your attention is one way. If that doesn't help you need something stronger, then we can help bring in certain drugs and see if that has an effect or not. You know, there's just no perfect. And what drugs answer. are those for these <laughs> overthinker <laughs> types? Oh, sorry. <laughs> that sounds yeah. horrible. They need help. So, so Heather, let me ask you a, yeah. a, a an awkward philosophical question. Mm -hmm. All right, and I, I I I come to you from the world of physics, and in physics, uh, we we physics has been around a long time. What I mean by that is there are things we've actually understood about the universe over many, many centuries by the works, the hard work and brilliance of key people who have been in our field. That is a much deeper history than psychiatry or psychology, right? When you think of sort of modern psychi psychology, it's, is it much more than a century old, really? I mean, maybe late 1800s. Whereas physics, we have authentic physics going back 500 years okay mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. my my question is could it be that neuroscience or or or, or a couch uh you know uh a couch therapy is something that needs breakthroughs of brilliant neuro people who haven't been born yet so that the day will come will you say you'll just analyze the neurochemistry and say here's what's wrong fix it here nip tuck do this drug, boom, and you walk out the door and it's one session in your okay. office. Okay, ready? This I love this question. So first of all, I mean, psychology- uh, well, I, I need buy-in on this. Marsha, are you with me on this? <laughs> with this? I'm freaked out because to me, it's like, because it's about the human brain, it can never be standardized in the way that physics is because humans are consciousness. Just like we were talking about in the first segment, it's about our consciousness. I don't so buy I that. I'll tell you why. I to I'm going to be devil's advocate. scan my brain. I'd be terrified they'd use it for evil. I'm, uh, <laughs> <laughs> so no here's what okay there was a day we look up at the night sky oh the moon is doing this and that and that's different from what mercury is doing and that's different for and everybody's doing their thing in the sky yeah and no one really understands it and exactly. so we're thinking oh my gosh well we'll never understand it because we are mortal and that's the divine space of the heavens and how can we ever understand divine thinking i see then, what you're saying now yeah and then, then single formulas of, yeah. come forth and it brings it all together under one coherent understanding so are we in this moment declaring the brain is just complex and we can never do it or are you admitting ignorance about where we <laughs> relative to where we could be one day so that the person walks in, you put them in one of your machines that I know you got in the back room there in your home and then goes boop. And then everything is fixed. Okay. Like I said, one-stop shop. Yeah, like, please. <laughs> okay, okay, go. 
oh, I'll tackle this in two minutes or less. Yes. Um, psychology arose out of philosophy. Philosophy was the origins of psychology. But technically, if you really, you know, the, 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 the science of the mind, you know, maybe a century, a century and a half old, true. The, the problem with the brain is subjectivity. So I've always been interested in the brain because I want to understand the neural basis of consciousness. How does this physical piece of matter create subjective states? It's, it's if the I most ask subjective you, thing there is in the world. Exactly. So if I ask you, are you depressed? I, you know, I can look at how you're acting, whatever, but I have to ask you on a scale of one to 10, how sad do you feel or how much pain are you in? Right? So until we can solve that problem of subjectivity, which is really what we want to work towards is having a unified theory of the neural basis of consciousness. And, and we're working on which that right now. Yet. Which we do not have, have that. We do not have an agreed upon theory of, of consciousness. And, and Marsha, you know, the best evidence that they don't have it is that if you go to the, the bookstore and you look for books on consciousness, there are shelf after shelf. <laughs> <laughs> and not just one. Not just one book. Says, there's there's one book on gravity on the shelf and there's 50 <laughs> books on consciousness. That means we know nothing about consciousness. Whoever right? figures out how but to we're narrowing it consciousness down. though. If you, but if you figure it out though, don't tell anybody because I don't want the clones. I don't want the, I don't want it. Well, this is the thing. The thing about consciousness is it's first person subjective experience. So the only one that can ever experience your consciousness is you to know what it feels like to be you. But there are a couple of main contenders of like, one is this integrated information theory of consciousness. The other is the global neuronal workspace theory of consciousness. Some talk about predictive processing and coding. So there's a bunch of theories out there floating around and we're actually engaged in a large scale study right now across labs to test these different theories against each other experimentally, which is very difficult to do in and of itself because of the problem of subject subjectivity. Also, um, but, could the concept of consciousness itself be malformed in how you even pose the question? Well, yeah. So I once actually debated Deepak Chopra on this topic because he's, he's philosophizing that consciousness just exists in the universe. It's a fundamental property of the universe. And we are just subjects of that we it creates matter right where i say no matter or me and my fellow neuroscientists matter creates subjectivity creates consciousness but there are some people with different philosophical views that say it exists in the universe and we're just like the conduits of it this is further so, evidence that nobody really knows anything we, <laughs> well, <laughs> but meditation says, helps. The, the universe gives it to <laughs> exactly. you and the other person says that you give it to the universe right if that's what you're arguing about you don't know anything <laughs> we're okay. far from but i do ultimately think that in the if we don't kill ourselves first as a human species it, over the course of time you know theories will emerge and and we will get closer um but because each brain is slightly different you would have to take each individual map out their entire brain understand their full history um and also the brain isn't static it's constantly changing so where you were yesterday is different than where you are Ooh, today so it's a moving target Ooh. so it's so many variables involved Ooh. that it's really hard yeah to pinpoint um and to change it in a way that's going to suit your it's going to change the person's behavior however the one thing we are getting closer with are neural implants where we can you know make a rat move left or right depending on how we direct it or make it eat or not eat and so we can start to control human behavior but if we can control how you feel and think, you know, I mean, we'll eventually get there, I'm sure. You know? <laughs> yeah, just, that's yeah, so that's a little scary. scary. I, I'm scared of that, Marsha. She said, well, when oh neural implants gosh. to control your behavior. Yes. Okay. Now, every time I go left or right, I'm going to go, am I doing this? <laughs> <laughs> Someone else making me. So we, so we have these quick... little remote controls at home, you know, ah, and that's how yeah, we. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah Marcia, you want a joystick yeah. that, that, that Heather's got you going on there. Uh, we got to take <laughs> a quick break. When we come back, Heather, I want to hear from you about the, the uh, clinical studies and laboratory studies of what the brain is doing when it's meditating or when it's not meditating or, or just what, what, what going inside the brain tells us about what's going on outside when Star Talk returns. We're back, Star Talk, segment three of meditation. And uh, we began with Dan Harris, who set us on this path. Uh, he's got a meditation app called 10% Smarter, is it, Marsha? 10% 10 10 happier. Happier, 10% happier. I think. Yeah, no, we, we really want one that makes <laughs> us all 10% smarter, all right? That we gotta yeah. work on that one. And we brought in Heather Berlin, our neuroscientist at large to help make sense of all of this, or neurological sense. Um, Heather, uh, all this talk about changes in people's behavior 
for whatever reason, be it meditation or drugs, do you see that in brain scans or neural implants or whatever it is you do behind a curtain when nobody's looking? <laughs> do we see changes in the brain after yes. meditation? Yeah, and amazingly so. So all these studies have been done. You know, they have people who never meditated before and then they have them meditate for eight weeks and then look at their brains, you know, before and after. And they also look at long-term meditators, you know, people who've been practicing their whole life. And you actually see an increase in gray matter. So normally the brain is aging, right, over time. And we're having a sort of a little bit of atrophy of gray matter. And they found that meditators, long-term meditators, a 50-year-old brain looks like what a 25-year-old brain would look like. But remind me what gray matter does for us. Gray matter is involved in all of our thinking, our cognition, um, planning, organizing. It's particularly in the prefrontal cortex, they see these changes. So what's the point um, of the rest of your brain? Making. You just listen to everything uh, I want my brain for. So what good is the rest no, of the rest brain? The rest of it's useless. So, well, anyway. sensory, it's all your sensory information. The subcortical areas are more of the emotional parts of your brain, your drives, your motivation, but they actually see changes in those areas too. So they have um, the amygdala involved in a fear response, your kind of fight or flight response, actually were smaller. And, the, and in the short-term meditators, the people who just did it for eight weeks, they looked at their amygdala activation in response to emotional pictures before meditating and then after, and they had less amygdala activation to pictures after they had meditated. So they had more emotional control. So increases in prefrontal cortex gray matter means that they can, you can regulate yourself. You can have more impulse control, control over emotions. Um, and it actually, you see these decreases in these subcortical areas. So it's both, you get these, these activation changes and you get really structural changes in the brain with meditation over time. Okay, so you have value judged in what you just said. You have value judged <laughs> those changes. But yes. Well, but the amygdala is a huge part of anxiety, right? Because that's basically like your fight or flight is uh -huh. triggered, but there's nothing to run from. So it, like your outside's not matching your inside. And uh -huh. I've heard that meditation, yeah, like that's interesting because I've heard that meditation just helps calm that fight or flight oh interesting marcia so you're saying that sometimes we're reacting in a way that would have been sensible if t-rex were chasing us exactly except, <laughs> except that is not that's not the threat you see that a lot i had a job where i worked with holocaust survivors and their kids had even worse anxiety than them because they grow up with all this physical anxiety, but their experience outwardly is very safe. So it doesn't make sense. And then they've now done studies about that, that kids of trauma and things like the Holocaust have these experiences with their brain chemistry. And it's just interesting hearing the science behind it. Cause I've heard about the amygdala and stuff. All right, but Heather, all right. So I'll, I'll give you that, but how about any activity that someone does intensely for eight weeks? If I if I take up chess and I get really into chess or some uh, 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 or some uh, I don't know martial arts does that change the brain Yeah something that it takes does. a lot of focus and intensity so is is, uh. is is meditation unique in this regard or is it just anything you do with focus and intensity will also trigger or uh, um, instill change permanent changes in the brain Absolutely, but it's the it's the skill set that you're training because your brain habituates, it learns anything. So if you're doing something bad, like things that are related to addiction, you get into a negative negative changes in the brain. But in this case, what you're learning with meditation is you're increasing activation in parts of the brain that have to do with. Um, your sort of what they call it quieting your your sort of monkey mind, that inner chatter, that self critic the, you know, the kind of inner voice that's the inner critic that's telling you you're not doing well or all the negative thinking. And you're gaining more control over those negative thoughts. You're gaining more control over, I mean, emotions are good to have, but not when they're being triggered for the wrong reasons, right? So what happens is you have a fast track to emotion where the amygdala gets activated, but then the, pre, the prefrontal cortex says, oh, wait, you know, this, there's nothing dangerous in this situation. You can calm down now. But if you don't have the right regulation to do that, oh. you, then, you're, so, then you're a victim of your own neurochemistry. Exactly. But this way you're taking control in a way over your, your brain. It's like the brain controlling itself. So with meditation, you're, you're becoming more aware of what's happening internally in your own mind and you're gaining more control so that you can enhance your positive experiences and help downregulate the negative ones and the you, thoughts. You know as what well. I did once, Heather? Uh, mm -hmm. I was 17 and there was uh, a, a friend of our family 
a, a, a friend of my mother's who had a son who was also 17, but I never, I, we played together when we were like three, but I didn't know him. And he died of brain cancer. It was very tragic. And th there was a funeral in River, uh, the chapel at Riverside Church. And they, it was during a school day. And he, he, he went to school in Westchester, but they took a bus of kids, brought them into Manhattan. And, the, and there's a picture of him on the casket. And, and the organ is doing its organ thing, funeral organ thing. Everybody's crying. Everybody's crying. And I'm saying to myself, uh -oh. I, I swear. Were this you is not crying? Uh-oh. I swear this is my, this is my, this is what I said to myself. I said, I do not know this person. Yet every force operating in the air right now wants me to cry over his death the, the the you know 15 16 year old kids helping each other walk down the aisle and, and he was a handsome kid so there's this handsome photo of him and i said and, and tears started welling up in my eyes and i said i'm only crying because everybody else is crying i don't actually feel this at all i said this to myself and then i said why don't i cry every day because thousands of people die every day in New York City for all kinds of reasons. I'm not crying then. So why should I cry now? So I suck those tears back up. And I, I still felt the moment, but I did not let the moment override emotions that I felt were artificially implanted in me. I did that when I was 17. I don't know if I should be proud of that moment or- <laughs> I cry at State Farm commercials. Are no! you serious? <laughs> I'm like- <laughs> this is how You cry different. at the commercial where the woman sings with the, the dogs, you know? Oh, the most manipulative bring grandma in and you haven't seen her in 20 years. I'll be sobbing. All like, of these, the they're, they're trying to manipulate me. And so Heather, mm -hmm. I, if, are you saying that I did something good or did I do something- um, uh, you know, yeah. so there's, there's, there's mis misanthropic. There's two, there's, it's interesting. So there's what we put a value judgment, you know, one of, of which is if you can have the right kinds of emotional control, you know, be able to express your emotions at the appropriate time, but not express them when you're being manipulated to do so and whatnot. So in, in that sense, yes. I'll tell you that organ was all in. On <laughs> <laughs> but there's a release. You're supposed to cry at a funeral because there's a collective release with ritual, even if like, it's not it's like I feel like our culture is so shied away from death that that's why you're that's why you're supposed to cry. But I also went but, to some funerals where some people I'm like you're doing this for attention, which is wrong. But. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Heather. So I think the emotional control can be a good thing. Um over again, over controlled like, you know, if you if you didn't cry if it was the funeral of someone you did know and had a connection to, that'd be a little different. But the other aspect is um and what meditation also helps increase the brain areas involved in is empathy. So you can have an empathetic response. You can okay. like the boundary between self and other, it can dissolve and you can feel more connected with people. Um, so you can increase empathy, but at the same time, have enough cognitive control to um, control your emotions in the appropriate way. Yeah, right? so, so, I, so I drew my line between tears dropping down my cheek. I, so I felt it, it was a very sad day. And so I, it's not that I didn't feel the sadness, but... I, I just could not. And, and, you know, I've been to some New Orleans funerals, right, where there is a jazz band and there's, you're, there's a celebration. So I don't think it's writ in the sky that one must cry at a funeral. You can use that time to celebrate the person's life, however brief they were on earth. But you know what you were exhibiting, which is really at that young age, was this sort of meta awareness. You know, you were making a decision about how you were going to choose to yeah, respond. I was, a, I was a geek kid. I was a complete yeah. geek kid. So there was this whole like parts of the brain modulating other parts of the brain. And that's what meditators do. I once did this um, experiment with this Shaolin monk who could withstand an enormous amount of pain. And so we put him in the scanner and we put these, these heaters on his wrists and we would just keep increasing the heat, heat to the point that he had burn marks on it. And he was just saying, I feel no pain, I feel no pain. And we look at his brain. Marsha, was this, is, this is the stuff Heather does. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you thought I was joking? I the stuff yeah. going on behind that curtain? And where are your offices located? <laughs> I have a couple friends. This was in the UK. <laughs> this was in the UK. Totally different rules there. Yeah, different oh, different yeah. legislative oh, rules. Yeah. Yeah. But when, when he was controlling this pain, 
you saw one part of his brain controlling the pain network in the brain. So he was literally using one part of his brain, this executive control to downregulate the pain network because pain doesn't happen in your arm. It happens in your brain. So if you can control one part of your brain with the other, you cannot experience pain. There are people who go through surgery without anesthesia by going into a meditative state. So it's just amazing how much, when I talk about this meta-awareness, how much control we can really have beyond what we even think is physiologically possible. We can control our own physiology. I, I, I hate to confess then, I used to do that. I, well, I used to wrestle and wrestle, there's a lot of things that are painful when you're wrestling. And I would say to myself, well, is, is the skin broken and am I bleeding? No, therefore <laughs> ignore it and keep going. <laughs> They've shown athletes, that's like, there was a really fascinating like sports science thing where about how athletes can play through a broken leg just by pure pain control and adrenaline and like the chemicals that come up where you can have a super bad injury and finish the game and then not feel the pain until afterwards, essentially. But then sometimes the pain is excruciating once they finally do feel it but they'll say i played for two hours on a broken leg didn't feel a thing as soon as the game was over i you know collapsed yeah so like, but it, it, in my case i would make the judgment whether it was just pain that pain sensors were sending to my brain or whether there's an actual physiological break that needed attention right uh, uh, medical attention I'd, I'd make that distinction and if it was just simply pain no matter how severe i would just ignore it and keep going and 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 uh, so I, I hope, Heather, that that doesn't mean I can't feel for people, right? Is that what you're telling me? That I think there are two different systems that are going on. One is this capacity to feel empathy, right? Which is a whole neural network in and of itself, which you you can very well have. I don't know. I may have to run some tests on you, but you know, <laughs> I'll, I'll give you the benefit of the doubt for now. So that's one thing. So it doesn't necessarily correlate with how much cognitive control or you know control you have over your thoughts and over pain. So you can have a, a ton of cognitive or, or control or emotional regulation, and that doesn't necessarily relate to how empathetic or not you are. You know, when you they, the reason they get they get they get sort of pushed together is because psychopaths tend to have an enormous amount of control and also don't have empathy. But but in in, in, you know, non-psychopathic humans, um, they don't have to be correlated. So Heather, just a quick question before we uh, close out the segment. Do you meditate at all? Or are you so in touch with your neuroscience yes. that, that's beneath you? Right, of course, yes. I was born in a very, no, I, I, um, I do meditate. Wait, wait, but Marcia, I, she's got a, I bet she's got a meditation machine in the back. <laughs> I bet. Electrode, the you know, implants. I just turn on meditation, <laughs> meditation mode. <laughs> you, got, you got a knob. <laughs> yeah. No. Go left, go right. <laughs> The thing about meditation is that there's this false narrative that you have to be like sitting perfectly, you know, in this sort of like legs cross position or whatever it is and be saying, um, and you know, you can really meditate anywhere, anytime, any place. And the, the more you can incorporate into your daily life, you know, you're waiting online, you know, to get your cup of coffee and you could go and you can kind of become focused inward, you know, go into your default mode, be very present in the moment, be very mindful of what's happening around you. And so, so I try to incorporate meditation into my daily practice every day, wherever I am. And I have a moment, but other things I do is I, I go for walks in the woods and I say, this is my time. I'm going to meditate, but my meditation can be just looking at the trees and, you know, being fully aware of what's going on around me or doing yoga. Um, so it's not like I wake up in the morning and say, okay, this is my 20 minutes of meditation. I'm going to turn on my app. Not that, you know, apps are great, but, but everybody has their own way to incorporate into their life. And I say the more flexible it is and the more you can find time to just be present and, and look in and check in with yourself, um, the better. Guys, we got to land this plane, but this has been uh, highly enlightening and, and introspective, uh, uncommon for what we normally do for Star Talk. So I'm glad to have you contribute to this, Heather. Thank and you. this has been a star talk an episode on meditation and and mindfulness and maybe we'll revisit this because it seems to be an endless topic uh, surely um ripe for future advances and discoveries that heather will be our a neuroscientist at large to bring. I'll be us. your neuroscientist guru. Guru. All right, guys, this has been Star Talk. I'm your host, Neil deGrasse Tyson, your personal astrophysicist. Keep looking up. <laughs> <laughs>